or go to church. <laughs> um, I was born in 1970, so the catechesis right after the Second Vatican Council was, was interesting. I like to tell how one Sunday I went to my catechism class and the woman brought her daughter in and she played the flute. The daughter did 45 minutes and that was our catechism class. So I uh, didn't really know a lot of the, what I call the Catholic calisthenics, sand, sit, kneel, right? Um, then, you know, got sort of bored with masks because I didn't understand it as a teenager and then kind of checked out um, in high school and college mentally checked out in high school, physically checked out in college, I was gone for a while and kind of came back. And even when I first came back to the faith and wasn't really kind of knowing it that well, there was sort of a comfort to it. Like I knew after being gone for, I don't know, five, 10 years or so, I knew when to stand, sit and kneel, right? You'll hear people say like the first time they went to a mass, if they're an adult and we're not kind of pro-cats, right? They seem lost. They don't know what's going on. I get it. Like, you know, if you do something every Sunday for 18 years, you can fight all you want, but it's going to be in you. <laughs> you know, my mom uh, commented at my ordination mass, my brother who hadn't been to mass in a million years, he still knows the creed. I'm like, you know, mom, if you do something every week for 18 years, it's, and he's a bright guy too, it's stuck in your brain unless you like a psychotherapy to get it out, it's in there. So listening to people talking about um, the Bible study is the same thing with me. Like I went to the seminary, I didn't know anything. And I was kind of introduced to that method to kind of understand the scriptures. So I thought that was kind of cool. Got lots of cool feedback that way. Then I thought I wanted to build on what we were working on. So I said, well, let's, let's kind of jump into the mass. Look at the Bible, how the Bible affects the way we pray. I think it's really important because, um, you know, a lot of times people, I see this, especially with funerals, you know, you might have people who wait for the church for a long time, they come back and they want to sort of recreate the mass into something it's totally not. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is not a celebration of the dead person's life. That is not what it is at all. Well, it is a celebration of the dead person's life. That guy, <laughs> that guy up there, right? So that's what we're doing. So I thought with this, um, with this book, um, we can sort of go through a little bit deeper into, into the understanding of the Mass. Um, about 10 years or so ago, we changed some of the verbiage. He talks a little bit in the book about that. Um, so my hope is to really kind of get people to appreciate the Mass. I see um, when people want to change it to make it more understandable for them, like, okay, I, I kind of understand what you're trying to do, but why not change who we are to understand what's been handed down to us, right? Um, the Greek churches, the Eastern churches, they haven't changed anything in 2,000 years. <laughs> you know, if you go to the liturgies, you really are going back in time. It's really cool to kind of go to the Eastern uh, right liturgy. So my hope is for us to understand what we're saying and what we're doing in, in, in the liturgy and then turn more deeply into that, um, into that reality. So my thought was today to kind of first open it up for any feedback you guys might have. Then um, I'm going to give a little talk about more about what I think we're trying to cover in this part of the book. Then I asked Lori to um, to dovetail with me to maybe talk about the the, the music piece of it, right? Um, and then so Brother Elias, who some of you met, is also a church musician. He's going to be tag teaming with um, with uh, Father. I always want to say Deacon Father John to kind of add that to it, right? Because. I forget which saint, if you know, tell me, it says to sing is to pray twice. Saint Saint, Augustine. Saint Augustine, there we go. It's in the Office of Readings. So with that, are there any questions, comments about what you read in, in, in the readings? And if anything comes from Zoom land, John, just raise your hand, then I'll pick on you or call upon you. So anything you guys saw in the reading in the first 49 pages that kind of struck you, that you want some more clarification from, or just helped you to understand the mass better? Yeah. Candace. Yeah, so what we're going to do is, so there's going to be back-to-back -back weeks. So I'm doing, we're doing tonight, and then next Monday night is the same third of the book, the first third of the book. So Deacon Father John and uh, Brother Lives are going to do that one. Then it's the 21st and 28th of July. We're gonna do the middle third of the book. And then in August, we're gonna do the final third of the book. 
It's in it's in the bulletin. There's a ton of them right here, so you can grab them on the way. It'll give you the full schedule. So, anybody have anything that you kind of read about it or want to throw out there? No, I thought it was interesting that um, it moves from the Old Testament and the New Testament parts of it, and it's and like like the Bible, it's just a collection of many different things. So every single phrase you kind of hang on, or it has a meaning at every part. And so, and we say it methodically at Mass sometimes, but now after reading it, some of the things you say during Mass or what we say to you. Um, it's definitely more impactful than that I've read some of this after so many years. Yeah, so I got a little feedback from when I preached on, um, you know, the creed, that section, God from God, life from life, true God from true God. You know, again, I rattled through that for, I don't know, 20 plus years, not really knowing what I was saying until I actually studied it. Anything in particular kind of jump out at you? Um, and with your spirit. Yeah, yeah. And that was big. Um, yeah. Not just, um, and, and, and. And with you also like hello, sounds yeah. with your spirit with that, that, that yeah. yeah. Um that was one of the more kind of stranger changes. I think people are like and with your spirit, like you know, what is it going on there? But again, I think even from like almost the very beginning of the mass, we're saying something is different. It's not just a gathering of friends, you know, there's something going on there. And as as the priest, you know, I, I have a special role, I am unworthy of it, trust me. But God, for whatever reason, God had chose me and said, I want you to, to be to be a leader in, in the liturgical worship here. And when you guys are saying with your spirit, you're acknowledging that, right? And I like the different scriptural reference they talked about where God is like, I will be with you to do this. Yeah, John? There's a lot to remember during the Mass. Any suggestions on how to work into it slowly? So the question coming from Zoom land <laughs> is that there is a lot to go to learn and to go over in the mass. Is there a way to slowly learn it? Is that what your question was? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> my hope is obviously we're starting with this book. Uh, as Tom said, he really appreciates more now and with your spirit. Um, <clears throat> there's another book that I will kind of let me know when it's, everyone can see this on Zoom world. Is that good? Okay, so this is a book, I'll turn it back in a sec, called The Catholic Church in the Bible, right? So the first part of it um, kind of talks about where the Bible, let me see if I can get this open. Um, the Word of the Lord, the Scriptures, a Theology of the Mass, the Biblical Prayers, and I'm going to talk a little about this. This will actually break down a lot more than, um, what's that? When you're finished. Okay, this will break down um, the prayers even more than this first book we had here, right? So he does a great job at breaking down the glory and the creed scripturally. So here's another book you can delve deeper into to understand what's going on. Then there's another book um, that I came across. It says the Latin Mass Explained. Now, I know today we have people who are doing the old rite, the Latin rite, right? This isn't how to do that Mass, okay? There's the Latin rite and there's the Eastern Rite. This has a wonderful explanation. Again, more theology of the scripture, starts getting into uh, the different vestments that'll be worn, the different parts of the church as well, and it'll break down further what it is we're trying to do. So who asked that question? That was Ben. Ben, okay, hey Ben, good to see you buddy. So um, these are some other resources that, that you can have that will help you to kind of go deeper into what it is. Lori. I have another answer to Ben's question about how can you, is there a way, like a method for getting to know the mass better and the responses and becoming more engaged? Join My answer to that is oh. join the choir. <laughs> I'm stone cold serious. Um, every choir rehearsal becomes like a little catechism class because we, in order to understand what we're singing, you know, or let me say it this way what we are singing is much more impactful if we understand what it is that we're singing and why we're singing it. And that naturally becomes a part of all of those rehearsals and all of the reviewing and preparing for a mass. We're preparing ahead of time for masses that are coming up, which is actually the responsibility of all Catholics. We are all supposed to have read the readings for Sunday before we show up. And people are forgetting that. I mean, thanks be to God that we got there. Sometimes that's just the best that we could do. But we can take it upon ourselves to uh, look ahead and have read those readings so that when we come to Mass, our oral, A-U-R-A-L, experience of the readings can be 
um, enhanced by the fact that we've looked at those words ahead of time. But the same thing is true with the singing. When we immerse ourselves into preparing Advent music, you are lifting up with your voice all of these scriptures that are particular to that season. And it, it becomes so much more meaningful. Preparing for Christmas, preparing for Easter, preparing the Psalms. Uh, the level of immersion that you get in the parts of the Mass, both the ordinary and the proper parts of the Mass, uh, is just, it just can't be beat. Um, so, but that is joining the choir a big step that lots of people are not ready to take, but I do, I do offer it. Another thing that we all know is just by going to Mass, the more frequently that you repeat something, the more likely that you are to find the groove of the thing. And so uh, if you can avail yourself of daily Mass, do that. Of course, we're supposed to be coming every Sunday, including uh, the vigil as an option. And the more that we're participating in a focused way, the more that that groove in the brain will be formed. Uh, even if you're a late in life mass goer, a late in life Catholic, uh, or someone who's just new to the mass or new again to the mass, um, participating in repetition is good. It's so interesting now that so many masses are being live streamed that there's probably no limit to the amount of time that you could spend participating in masses and hopefully they're live. Here's another super interesting thing about that is just that um, masses are the union of heaven and earth. So they are meant to be a live activity that you would participate in and not a TV show that you would watch later. So that's just like a little interesting factoid about that, that now we have masses that are recorded and they've in some way become discreet um, you know, they, they are not, they're kind of separated from the live action. So that's kind of an interesting wrinkle that we're going to have to learn to deal with. But just the participation and watch the bulletin because now that we're allowed to have congregational singing, we're going to start having choir rehearsals again too. Thank you. Um, for those of you who know Karen Leahy, her, her, Leahy, her, 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 uh, her catchphrase is the, uh, the rummage sale. I think I see a new catchphrase every time Lori gets up there. It's going to be join the choir, um, which is great. Also, um, lectors, also uh, Eucharistic ministers, also ushers. So there's lots of ways to get to get to, to become involved. But I think the best way to get involved is um, just to kind of understand what we're trying to do here. Like, I think a lot of times people have this feeling like if I'm not physically doing something, then I'm not participating. I've seen this a lot at different parishes I had. The kids at the school masses, they wanna multiply like all the jobs for the kids to do. And I think we're giving a, a wrong sense of, of participation, mm. right? Um, mm. Think about when you watch a movie, right? If you're watching a movie, are you moving? No, but what's going on in your mind? If it's a scary movie, ugh, right? If it's a suspense till you're on the edge of your seat, if it's one of those horrible movies, other things going on, right? So we can see where without physically moving our bodies, we can be actively engaged with something. And that's what I'm hoping we're going to be doing this with the mass. So even if we're not being a lector or a Eucharistic minister or a choir person, I'm actively participating. So as Tom pointed out, when I say, and with your spirit, whoa, the spirit of God is dwelling among us, right? Um, that's when the Catholic calisthenics of up, stand, sit, and kneel take on a much a much higher understanding and purpose. We have another Zoom in. Hold on, before we go to the next Zoom in, anybody local here before we go to Zoom in? Yeah. You mean when he was breaking it down a bit? Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, I mean that's that's basically we're we're there with with, with the with the uh, the angels singing glory, yeah. glory to God in the highest. Right here he is, with among us. And this book, if we have time, breaks the glory down like line by line from the scriptures as well. So we had a zoom zoom land. Okay. I also think it is reading the responses versus just saying what was memorized. I am much more interested in really understanding what I am saying. Say that again. I also think it's the reading. I'm sorry. I also reading, think like it, it is reading the responses versus just saying what was memorized. Oh, I, I get what they're saying. That the act of 
reading those responses, maybe in the book or in your missile, and like seeing it, you know, breaking mm -hmm. open, it open sure. in that way, turned on a okay. bulb, light bulb instead of just the rope sure. getting out of this mundane sort of repetitive sort of thing. So there's a thing called the Roman Missal that you can get. There's also this thing called the Magnificat. Um, it's, a, it's a monthly um, publication. It's also digital now as well, where it would have all the mass parts in it. So yeah, you, you can actually, you'll see people, you know, with, with their either their physical missile. Um, so if people are looking at their cell phones during mass, we're gonna assume the best, we're gonna assume that they're actually looking at uh, you know, the sports game, <laughs> they're actually looking at, at the maps. I'm sure when books first came out, people were scandalized that people had books at church, right? But we're going to a digital world. I know um, Tim, who many of you know, he has his phone. He said to me, Father, he said, please understand, I'm following along. I'm like, look, I get it. I get it, right? So, so yes, if you, if you are a visual uh, learner, or a visual, more visual person, if it's a Magnificat, if it's a, if it's a Roman Missal, um, and if you need some help finding those, email me and I can send you some suggestions for that. Is there a hand on? Yeah. A um, couple of things. Uh, I think the, uh, the things you say to Mass and connecting with scripture is really uh, illuminating for most Catholics. Uh -huh. Uh, because I think when I was doing the Bible study and the men's group that I'm involved in, the scripture reading, yep. and you go, whoa, when you say that at Mass, or mm -hmm. I'll hear it said and I'll say, I just read that, and I do think we've come to a place where sometimes we're repetitive. And I think the way around that is to hear yourself say the words, yep. listen to your own voice, and then you will impart voice and reflection, and, and it's no longer just, no, 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 you're no longer just going. And uh, to speak with what we said about what stood out through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Yeah. My daughters don't go to mass, and they did with me one time. I'm like, Dad, that's ridiculous. You beat yourself up 10 times. But in the book, he says, if you can apologize, some apologies require more yeah. than just sorry. Yeah. And if you're going to apologize to Almighty God, <laughs> you better, get, you know. Dig down deep and, and mean it. So that jumped out of me too. Like. Also, linguistically, like, you know, we have the superlative, you know what I mean? Um, they didn't have that. So when you see, like, verily, verily, or amen, amen, it's sort of like you're saying, through my fault, through my fault. Oh, little. Little. And there's nothing wrong with beating ourselves up from time to time because sometimes we need it. <laughs> Not all the time, of course, right? Um, so, so, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, a good, that's a good point there. I also think just sort of like, 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 like the flow of the mass. I love to the sign of the cross. One of my friends said, every time his kids leave the house, he does two things. He calls them over, he prays over them, he lays his hands right smack on their head, and he says, um, prayer over them, God bless you, whatever. Then he says, ready, moms and dads? He says, make good choices or decisions. I forget which it is. Every time they leave his house, right? So parents, godparents, grandparents, whatever it is, you know, be praying over little ones. Mother's prayer, father's prayer, powerful, right? So I think that, you know, this, this first part of the mass, like, what are we doing? Like, I also see the mass sort of as, and if anyone wants to jump in, just raise your hand, I'm going to keep talking about I kind of see the mass as um, almost like an opera, right? It's got, it's got, it's got four, four parts to it. And musically too, I've shared sort of my understanding of the views of the glory. I think like the opening song should be like the trumpets blasting. So anybody coming out with a San Luis and Santa Cruz should be like, hey, what's going on in there? You know what I mean? Like, hey, what are you guys doing in there? You know what I mean? So you have that music that's blasting. We do the sign of the cross with, with your spirit. I confess, right? We're all sinners, right? We're all sinners. I'm a sinner. And then what are we doing? Lord have mercy. Well, if we beat ourselves up, right? You say to your daughters, if we have beaten ourselves up, well, guess what? God comes in and says, okay, I give you mercy, right? And then we're going, we'll talk about the glory in a second too. So I kind of see that, and I like where, you know, you know, sometimes you'll have, like, one of the things, I love praise and worship music, but one of the things I don't like, it has one sort of emotion, and that's <sighs> praise and worship, right? We did a, a, a Good Friday uh, uh, service in my last church, and the praise and worship band did the music there. And as they're bending right in the cross, they're singing, Our God is an Awesome God. If you don't know the song, it's our God is an awesome God. He reigns. I'm like, no, no, no. He, he's dying. <laughs> like he's dying on his cross. So I think musically, and Laura will talk about music too, is like the trumpet should blast. 
we come in, we acknowledge our, our sinfulness, we acknowledge we need mercy, then we're like ready to sit down and say, okay, now let's be fed. We'll talk about the word in the Eucharist next time. And I think the music should kind of get more and more uh, mysterious, more and more sort of spiritual. So by the time we're at the elevation, you know, I mean, we've entered into this complete, the, anything within, outside these walls should be gone from our minds, right? Everything should be gone. We should be focused, what? Directly upon the Eucharist, right? So he talks about in the beginning, like the three things. Um, he talks about the Eucharist is a memorial, right? And we'll talk about that. We go over the Eucharistic part, the real presence of Jesus Christ, right? We're in the, in the presence of God, so we have this very spiritual uh, experience going on. And then Holy Communion, we're coming together, right? And I think our, our actions, our thoughts, our music, everything should be going towards that. And then near the end of the Mass, we're, we're, we're processing out the same thing. Those trumpets should be blasted. And everyone again is like, what are you guys doing in there, right? So to me, it's like either going up the mountain or going down into the valley, right? We're kind of going, we're starting in one place, we're journeying to a, a peak, and then we're coming back out again to go up the Anything from Zoom land? Mary, did you, did you want to ask, Mary want to ask a question, but uh, I'm, I'm, one yeah. Second, uh, let's see. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I wanted to say when you were talking about the scriptural connections to the mass and understanding the mass better, how recently the, um, am I on high enough? Um, You're good. Okay. The, the gospel about the, um, I don't remember if it was the um, Jairus or the Roman centurion, but the one who says, I'm not worthy to have you enter into my, under my roof, Yeah, you know, and that's that, the, the, the thing that we sometimes, unfortunately, just reel off because we yeah. wrote, memorized it right before Eucharist, but realizing that that was, those were the words of a man directly to Jesus and expressing his faith. And furthermore, a man who, who was not a follower yet. That's right. He was a Gentile. Was an outsider. And so yep. here I am you know, as, you know, sometimes an outsider, somewhat an outsider, but somewhat an insider, repeating his words makes it that much more um, powerful. So I'm looking forward in reading this book to finding more sentences or phrases that come from Bible stories um, so that I can relate to them better. <laughs> Uh, you know, glory to God in the highest. Well, that's the angels at the nativity. I, I know that, but there's got to be a whole lot more, I'm sure. And so I'm looking forward to that in this course. And and um, so again, this book here uh, helps to break that down. So for instance, it says, glory to God in the highest and earth, peace to people to those whose favor rests upon him. That's Luke 14. Uh, Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father. Alleluia, the Lord has established his reign, our God, the almighty, Revelation 19.6. We worship you, Revelation 22 says, worship God. We give you thanks, Ephesians 5.20 says, giving thanks always and in everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. We praise you for your glory, uh, Revelation 7.12. Amen, blessings and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving, honor and power and might be given to God forever and ever, amen. So again, this book here is going to break that down for you line by line. The other thing I really liked about the Centurion story, uh, Mary brought up was excellent one. He's like, you don't have to come. You know what I mean? You don't have to do anything. You just got to say the word and it'll happen. I mean, talk, and Jesus says, never seen faith like this before. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people are like, you know, I think of uh, the king who, was it Naaman? Who, uh, they, no, Naaman the prophet says to the king of, I think, Syria, just go and wash in the water. And he gets bummed out. He's like, this is ridiculous. Like he wanted something super, what's that? Yeah, he, and then like, and like his friend is like, well, you know, just do it. <laughs> and then he does it and his leprosy is gone. You know what I mean? So I think that's another strong point about that. So when those changes occurred, part of it was to be more faithful to the scriptures as the, that Mary pointed out. Part of it was also uh, more, more theological. So one of the changes was from seen and unseen to visible and in, invisible. Right now, from my perspective, you're seen, right? If I put this in front of my, my eyes, you're unseen. Well, that's with me. 
invisible and visible, what are we referring to? The visible world, what's the invisible world? The angels, right? So that's, that's why some of those changes happen. I know this is to be more to be more faithful to the Latin. So the example of that is um, consubstantial. You know, instead of, what do we say? And with your, and with your being, what used to say? Thank God I can't remember it because I get confused. Like change the entire creed, not like every 13th word. I was like, what? Anyway, so it's just to be more, to be more. One in being, one in being, one in being. Yeah, okay, good, good. So, um, so that, that would be the Gloria then. And what's the last part? Then the collect, right? The collect is we're coming together. So what have we done? We've come into church. We've made the sign of the cross. We've uh, brought our sins to God. If we have mortal sin, we go to confession. We've uh, asked for mercy. Then we've sung the Gloria, right? You know, it's the, the number one uh, single since uh, zero, <laughs> since 34 AD. Um, do you know when, when did that start? That's real early in the church, right? Do you remember it, it, it actually is one of, one of the first prayer slash hymns of the church, right? And then, and then the collect. So the priest on behalf of the people is bringing in all the prayers together and saying, okay, God, here we are. We're going to bring all these prayers. And I think going back to Ben's question, <clears throat> I think, and I'm, I'm horrible at this because I'm so impatient, but I'm trying to be slower when I say, and let us pray, right? In the beginning of the Mass, we say, and let us pray, that's when we're like, ah, to be more actively engaged, as, as I think Ben was asking earlier, that's when you're like, okay, God, here's why I'm here, here's what I'm praying for, here's what I want to do, here's, what I'm, here's what's going on here. That's what I think we have to get people more, uh, more, more involved in. Instead of just saying those words, and I, I'll confess sometimes, I pretty sure I blow right through it. Um, but that's where it's like, okay, I'm bringing my prayers to you, God. Because the Mass is the most powerful prayer that we have. And I think if we were more prayerful, myself included, in understanding it, doing it, that's when it's like, okay, I, I get a lot out of the Mass. We're not supposed to get from Mass. We're giving God our thanks, our praise, but we're human beings too. And we have that beautiful spiritual, spiritual communion. I think in his book in the beginning, he was talking about the woman on the plane. Does he talk about this in the book? You guys remember that story? Yeah. And what did she say? She was a Christian. She went to mass. She knew there was something going on here. And I've, I've had friends who've come to ordinations or stuff like that. And they're like, that was kind of cool. Like they didn't really get, but they knew that there was something, something cool about it. We were talking the other day with people who were traveling in Europe and they weren't believers, but they're like, when we went into those churches in Europe, we just knew, we just knew there was something, <laughs> something going on here. Yeah, yeah, very, very good. Any questions locally? Anybody coming in from Zoom land? Um, ben wanted to know if, if you could, uh, the meaning of the sign of the cross. The meaning of oh, it? Oh, wait. Could Father Jerome go through the meaning of signing of the cross? So he talks about where it, the different people were, were, were doing the sign of the cross. Like, um, let me see if I can get the reference for you right here. Um, so he was talking about how the, the, the prefigure in, in Ezekiel 8, he talked about how that there was, there was a mark put on their forehead. And it doesn't exactly say, but they, they speculated it was the tau, which is one of the letters. And it, look, it looks like a T. Uh, the Franciscans will have a tau cross. So if you're Franciscan friends, you might see this Tau cross. That was one of them. It also talks about when they're going to destroy uh, Nineveh. He goes through, let me, let me move back so it doesn't look like you're talking to my chin. <laughs> talks about how there's going to wipe out and they go through putting, putting a sign on everybody. The book of Revelation talks about there's a sign upon, put, upon, put upon the believers, right? So over time, and then Jesus says in Matthew 28, go out preaching the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the words come from Father Matthew 28. And this understanding of a sign we see both in the Old Testament and we see it also in the very end of the New Testament, Revelation, and they came together. It's sort of marking it, right? You, you want to mark yourself. If you think about, you know, it sounds kind of flippant, but what do, what do, what do, uh, what do um, gangbangers do? They tag, right? The spray paint. What are they saying? This is mine. So God has given, God knows who we are. If we don't do something in our faith life, it's going to come out somewhere else. You know what I mean? So God is saying, I've given this wonderful ability. We're kind of marking ourselves. We're saying that we are, we are God's, right? When your children, when you pray over your children, same thing. These are God's children. The mark of the cross is an indelible sign, too. It, it, like in baptism. 
yep. and the priest puts the sign of the cross on the person, that doesn't come off. So mm -hmm. even though it's not something that you see, it's not like a tattoo or something, but it's this indelible sign that can't be removed. It's what can separate us from the love of Christ. You know, once you've been marked with the seal of the sign of the cross, at ordination, that sign is made, you know, uh, the mark is made on the priest's hands. And his hands are holy, therefore, consecrated for the rest of his days. And it says in the Old Testament scriptures, set me as a seal on your heart, mm -hmm. as a seal on your arm. And in the Jewish tradition, they'll still wear the phylacteries, they'll wrap these uh, signs on their arms, but we make the sign of the cross as an indelible sign. It's, it, and we, do, we wear it too, you know, lots of people will wear a cross somewhere or something, but it's not um, the wearing of the object or the clothing that matters. It's the sign that we make, uh, and making it you know, in the sacrament as well as just all the times that we make that prayer. I uh, had Immaculate Heart Sisters growing up that taught our catechism when I was young. And there was one of them that had said, the sign of the cross, when you take that at the beginning of any prayer, you're doing at the beginning of the mass. She was teaching little kids now, brain and soul. But she said, um, it's kind of like mm -hmm. her on the <laughs> Because you're making, the con you're making that connection, like, Dialing up God, I call upon the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and then you have the conversation. Um, and I thought that was just a really cute, clever way to, to say to kids, you know, you're calling on the name of the Lord, and then you can enter into that conversation with Him once you make that connection. I, that's what I tell people, well, everybody, especially the kids, I say, you know, there is a spiritual world out there that we do not want to be communicating with, right? You would never just say, whatever spirit's out there, come here, because guess what? They're going to come. You know, the sign of the cross says, I, and I use the, the, phone, the phone number too, I say, you're saying I'm talking to God and God only. So in one sense, it's a blessing, it's a protection too, because the last thing the devil wants to do is come near the sign of the cross, right? You're going to run away. Is that somebody asking a question or do they just gurgle it in there? Okay. Okay. Somebody said, I thought there was something about bringing God into the present location. Well, invoking God to be present, sure. That's. Is there. Is, well, ask him to give us some more context to that. Um, ben, do you want to talk? Good. Hold on. Ask to end. Well, I, think, I think Lori covered it when she said okay. dialing up. Dying in. I mean, and also, like, you know, I know it might seem kind of, you know, uh, Hollywoodish, but I mean, when when they're doing exorcisms, they use a crucifix. And it is it is a very, very, very powerful tool. I mean, you should have at least one crucifix in your house, you know. Um, it is a powerful tool. And the houses that are haunted, I've read accounts that aren't like, you know, Hollywood sensationalized. They're like, their crucifix kept disappearing, or their crucifix, they'd find it all over the place. I mean, it is, it is a powerful sign. It is a very powerful sign. And, and that's why we should be using it, especially in our kids, all the craziness going on today. We should be protecting them with that, with that sign of the cross. Do you have anything music-wise you want to add? Sure. Come on down. Of course I did. <laughs> so, um, John, am I, am I like a talking neck or how? Am I good? Okay. Um, Couple things. So Father Jerome had mentioned that he really appreciates when the entrance song is a big trumpety herald kind of thing. And that's a great way to open a mass. But what's inherently important about the music at mass is that it should always be text painted. And what that means is that the prayers of the church are, the music is there to highlight the text and it doesn't exist unto itself. Like it's not just there for the sake of itself because it's pretty and it's nice and it's not some cherry on top of the Sunday. It's actually there to illuminate the words of the scriptures and the words of the prayers that we're making. So um, here's two examples of entrance texts that might come off very differently musically. Uh, and they both come from ordinary time. I didn't zero in on something that was specifically Christmassy or specifically Eastery. So for one, random Sunday in ordinary time, the opening text for this, the singing on the way to the altar is, turn to me and have mercy on me, O Lord, for I am alone and poor. 
See my lowliness and suffering and take away all my sins, my God. Right, so that's an entrance song. So how does that come across musically? Well, thanks be to God for creativity because there are some countless number of pieces of music that have set that text and we hear them at mass. Um, now here's another, this was totally random. I just opened to a Sunday in ordinary time and read one. I said, okay, I'll use that one. And I flipped to another one randomly. And I said, okay, I'll use that one because on another random Sunday in ordinary time, it says for the entrance, all peoples clap your hands, cry to God with shouts of joy. For the Lord is high and awesome, a great king over all the earth. So those are both entrance texts, but they have very different character. And how a composer would elect to set that music would, you know, certainly make a difference. So when we're looking at music to sing at the mass, we look at what the church prescribes as the text that we're intended to hear to gather our thoughts for that particular celebration. And then we look at as many pieces of music as we can possibly find that use that text and say, what makes sense, you know, for us in this community? What's singable for us? What's pleasing to the ear for us? Because what, what works for us might not be the same thing that works in another part of the country or another part of the world musically, because, you know, like creativity is what it is and there's a great abundance of stuff. When it comes to the Kyrie and the Gloria, which are big parts of this section that we're covering tonight, I think one of the interesting things that could be drawn out that, uh, well, first of all, I was kind of frustrated when I, Father said, you know, the first part is going to, well, you can talk about the Curie and the Gloria. And then I looked at Dr. Shree's book and he says already in it all the things that a lot of the things I say to choirs, you know, when I'm trying to inspire the choir to really lift up that Gloria, I say, this is the song that the angels sang when the Christ child was born, all these scenes that we see in art of angels, you know, in their grandiosity hovering over the manger or in the sky or all this, the glorious, the beautiful way that angels are depicted. Imagine what they sound like when they're singing. That's the Gloria. That's the sound that we want for the Gloria. But he stole my line in the book. So, no, it's, I mean, it's just out there. It's factual information. That's the prayer that we have from the scripture. And the angels sang, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. And we need then musically, we see a tremendous contrast. And we want hopefully the choir and the people to execute that shift musically from something that's very penitential, that part of the mass that includes the confiteor and the curie is called the penitential act. We are acting in a penitential way. So musically, we wanna make a shift from penitence to great, grandiose kinds of joy. And it happens on a dime. And I think that having the music reflect that really, it needs to pop right? Uh, because the idea of we make the sign of the cross and we evoke, invoke the name of the Lord, we immediately recollect our sins and say, we come to you, Lord, as we are. And we came in with these burdens and we came in with these stains and we came in with this baggage. And we take that moment to acknowledge it. And then after we ask for his mercy, huzzah, Gloria, it's gone in an instant. I mean, that, I'm getting goosebumps. That shift, because there's no, there's, there's no break. It actually says in the general instruction that the Gloria starts immediately. The Curie ends and the Gloria starts. Now there's actually three different forms of the penitential act. And so there is a case in which the priest says, may almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, bring us to our lasting life, and then the Gloria starts. So there's a couple different forms of it, but in one of the forms of it, there's actually like a do not pass go, do not collect $200, do not stop. The Kyrie turns into the Gloria like that. Um, and whether or not, the and if the priest says that prayer in between, that's all the same, because then he closes that penitential act for us, and then the Gloria comes exploding onto the scene, and that's the way it should feel musically. So if it's not come over and pinch me and say that I didn't do my job. 
Uh, another thing musically about the differences with Kyrie and Gloria, Kyrie operates in music, um, well, it operates in the prayer and then is painted in the music. As a call and response prayer, the priest says, Lord have mercy. And then the people say, Lord have mercy. And then the priest says, Christ have mercy. And the people say, Christ have mercy. And then, and so on and so on. So we have the threefold invocation of mercy. We love to do things in threes, right? We're super, super good at that. Um, in the old mass, it was Kyrie, 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 Christe, 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 Kyrie, Kyrie, Kyrie. So it's three times three. But now we just have this call and response, which is perfect because of what Father said the earlier. The priest has his role to play in this. And the priest is a minister of God's mercy in the world. And it hearkens to the sacrament of reconciliation where and scripturally those sins that you hold bound are held bound and those sins that you forgive are forgiven and the priest himself with his own humanity and his own stuff that he brings with him to mass he invites the lord's mercy to come upon us and we echo that but he leads and we follow and that call and response aspect is really critical he is an agent of God's mercy in the world. And the first thing that he does after he gathers us with the sign of the cross and we all make it together is he acts as an agent of God's mercy and he invokes God's mercy upon us. And we repeat it and say, yes, please, God have mercy. So that's like super beautiful. Um, but the Gloria in music is what we refer to as through composed, meaning it starts at the beginning and it travels straight all the way through to the end. And there's no, none of that repeating stuff. And in point of fact, when the new Roman Missal came out, was towards coming out, the new translation was coming out in 2012. Prior to that, there had been a set of instructions that had been administered to people who were going to be composing music for the mass to remind them to not have repeats inside the Gloria because it's not a call and response prayer of the church. We all sing in conjunction with the angels, glory to God in the highest and so on and so forth all the way through to the end. There was a little trendy little thing that happened in some of the um, popular mass settings where composers were having that first line of the glory to God be repeated and then they do like a verse of it and come back and do a verse of it and come back. No, that was not appropriate because that's not how that prayer is outlined for us based on the scriptures, based on the traditions of the church. And it needed to be, it needs to be, it always was through composed. It was just a little blip on the radar. A couple of people did it that way. And it was like almost, I get in trouble on being recorded, but it's almost an accident. I think it was like well-intentioned, but it was never meant to be that way. So when the, the new missile was coming out, they said, oh, and by the way, if you were thinking of doing that, don't do that. <laughs> um, because it also helps to highlight that difference between Kyrie and Gloria too. But we're singing in union with all the angels and the saints. So there's no me first, then you aspect of that prayer or an us, them aspect of that prayer, like there kind of is in the Kyrie where the priest leads and we, we repeat. Um, it's a totally different character. So those are some things that I would say about music for those particular parts of the mass. Dr. Shri does not actually talk about the entrance chant. So thank you for giving us the opportunity to say that that actually, it's not the opening of the mass, really the sign of the, the priest opens the mass. However, the entrance chant has always been a part and parcel of the mass. Um, and the texts that are there, they're, they're traditionally their psalms, all of those things, the entrance, chant, the offertory, the communion, those are all, they typically come from the psalms. However, they occasionally come from other places. Just like our responsorial psalm, mostly they come from the psalms, but every once in a while you get something from Isaiah, you get something from Daniel. Every once in a while in the responsorial psalm, it's actually from another passage. So that does happen. Uh, and it's interesting to see when it does and what the character of that celebration is. So those are fun things I would say about music. Good? Yes. Some glorias are very sad in minor 
and don't always sound very celebrating, celebratory and majestic to me. Some of those refrain glorious are easier for the whole congregation to sing. Those may be observable facts. There are glorious that could be written in minor keys because of creativity being what it is and minor keys to our ear can tend to sound sad. However, there are a great many minor key pieces that actually are jubilant. And there are some things, there's a lot to be said in music about execution. Um, sometimes a piece can, whether it, it can be in a major key and come off sad because it wasn't well executed or it can be a, in a minor key. Um, and be intended to be jubilant, but because of the way that it's delivered, it could fail in that sense. Um, and then, you know, there's a subjectivity factor here. If there's a piece that's in a minor key, minor keys tend to sound sad. Maybe there is a Gloria that just sounds sad to some people. Um, and then we don't ever know what a composer was thinking when he or perhaps she created the piece. What was the the tone and the mood and the character and what was going on in the person's mind and heart when that melody came across. Um, the, there was a, those, looking for a word, sorry. The, the refrain glorious. So I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with them musically speaking in terms of, yes, like where there are certainly some very jubilant ones, absolutely. Does it make it easier for people to respond if you get to repeat a line over and over again? Well, of course it does, you know, it certainly does. But we're talking about the character of that particular prayer and it and contrasting it with the Kyrie. So a through composed thing was just the intention for that prayer, that's all. And it doesn't mean that those other ones were like bad or something. Um, they just sort of missed the mark of what we're trying to accomplish when we go through that entire prayer. But there's, a, there's, you know, there's devil's advocate, there's arguments to be made for different kinds of prayer. I mean, why do we extract a line from the psalm and we repeat that line over and over again instead of reading the psalm all the way through? Because that's the character of that part of that prayer. We're extracting a particular line from the psalm and saying, this message we want to shine forth in this um, particular execution of the prayer. Like for example, um, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. That is a line from that Psalm, but it's not the whole Psalm, but we hear that as a refrain all the time. But there's another line that's used as a refrain from that Psalm. Um, that uh, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. That's a line from that Psalm that gets used as a refrain. So there's different lines that are extracted at different times. And I'm venturing into like another section of the book. So I don't wanna spend too much time over there. But the idea of having musical refrains is a beautiful idea because it does help us to repeat. I know as well, zillion there's 150 but I know lots and lots of psalms I have them retained in my head because I've sung them and that's why I was saying you know if you want to really immerse yourself in different parts of the mass and different scriptural texts and different flavors of the seasons and stuff join the choir because singing this stuff over and over again really really does do that so singing a refrain of a gloria is not in and of itself a bad thing. And I hope that's not what I communicated. Um, but musically, what we're set up to do is have a call and response with the priest during the penitential act, and then sing in union with the choirs of angels when we sing the Gloria. Yes, Tom. Yeah, so most, um, I didn't, I didn't see it that way because it puts me in a really good feeling. Mm -hmm. As long as the neighbors don't feel like I'm sacrificing animals and the neighbors don't have Right. So it's a really, it is special in a different way. Yeah. There's, there's an element of subjectivity to all of this. Uh, Palestrina was one of the greatest composers in the history of the church. And it was when polyphony was first becoming um, a thing that was going to be accepted. And if you don't know what polyphony is, basically it means harmonizing.
It used to always be the case originally with some of the music of prayer that in order for the text to be heard clearly, there could only be one melody happening at a time. So that if someone broke off and started to harmonize, it was like, oh, I can't understand what you're saying. And if I can't understand the words, we, we can't go there because we have, we're singing scripture. We need to hear the words. And so harmonies were not permitted at all. Then it came to pass that, you know, the beauty of that was beginning to be appreciated. And we thought, well, if this is truly beautiful, then we, then we need to use this in worship and we need to use this in church because we need to offer to God the most beautiful gifts that we can give. And therefore harmonization became a thing. And Palestrina was the guy. He was like commissioned to be the composer for the church because he was really, really good at polyphony and he was a really faithful person. So what did Palestrina's music sound like? Well, we can have really absolutely no idea because nothing was recorded. And I'm going there to say, I'll, I should bring an example next time. Uh, we have a way in, I'll call it Western music and Western civilization, Western culture that we imagine that Palestrina's music sounded. I accidentally purchased um, a CD of Palestrina's music that was recorded in an Eastern country. And I can't even remember where right now I have to go get the CD, I have to find it. It's buried in all of my stuff that I've collected over the years. And I know the mass, it's a Palestrina mass. I know how it goes. I've sung it, I've directed it. I, you know, it's just one of his pop popular, if you can say that it's you know niche market, but it's one of his popular masses. And I put this CD in and the sound that came out of the CD would curl your hair. I couldn't, but it, I recognized it sort of, but the timbre of the voices, the speed, the execution, was definitely culturally affected by those people in that country who were doing, it was, it was Palestrina, it was church music. They didn't change a, a note or a word, but the sound was just, was very abrasive to my ear. So it would be interesting to play uh, two versions of that back to back so people could maybe hear and say, look, everybody hears music differently and we react to it and let's hope that within our community, what we are doing is reflective of the spirit of the people who are gathered here. What year was this? What year, Palestrina? Yes. Oh, that's so great. Polyphony, Palestrina, brain freeze. I don't know, Google him. Like a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was that was poor. I'm having a brain freeze, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, yeah, I, is there any other questions about that? Did I did I touch on anything you useful? Just hold the class, just like music and else. You can do that, right? It's just a teaser. Yes. So thank you. So I also uh, really appreciate the, uh, the, the mat when we're singing. So we all say the Our Father, right? We all know that prayer by heart. So a couple of years ago, I, I think it was like the, the, good, the Holy Thursday liturgy. Uh, I intoned it, let us pray with confidence of the Father. Was it? And the entire congregation in Benicia sang it. I mean, and people came up to me, and I felt it too. They came up to me after Mass and said, the Holy Spirit almost blew the roof off this church. And we were singing that. I mean, I'm not one to be like touchy-feely and stuff like that, you know what I mean? I was, I was really moved. So um, I forget who asked the question, even like a, like a minor key Gloria, if you have 200 voices doing it, you know what I mean? Maybe that's just gonna really, really pop, you know? So um, yes, I think if we get more people more conscious about the, the prayers they're gonna be saying, get more people conscious about why we're saying these different prayers and then get people more and more active in the singing will really elevate it. Um, when I went to Deacon John's ordination, uh, it was bells and smells. You know what I mean by that? Bells and smells. It was like incense and hats and croziers and we had vimps and multiple altar servers and three deacons. I mean, it was just liturgically just over the top. 
off. I was like, ooh, there's something nice. One of my friends came to my ordination, and he's a, he's, he'll tell you, he's a secular Jewish person, spiritual but not religious. And we're, when me, the mess was three hours when I was ordained, right? When we were done, I saw him that night at dinner. He goes, you know what? I got to hand it to you Catholics. You guys know how to do this now. You know, he's like, you had a guy with a funny hat and it's, you know, and it really is. Like when we really understand the, 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 the ritual of it, it's really powerful. I'll give you the inverse. A friend of mine was forever asking, come to my church, come to my church. I was like, all right, I'll go to church. So I went to her church and um, it was, you know, not like a non-denominational church. And I walked in and just the architecture was just bland. There was nothing on the walls, no stained glass, no, no art, no nothing at all. Um, I like our church. Leave the station. They're coming. Yeah. Um, so they also had um, movie theater seats with the little coffee rest arm thing there. And it was, the liturgy was a half an hour concert, a half an hour preaching and other kind of stuff, and then a half an hour concert. And I just was like, now cradle Catholic never became Protestant or anything else. It just, it did not speak to me. And when we walk in, what's front and center of our church or should be? Our Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Now I'm a drummer. When I walked into their church front and center, a drum set. And I was just like, I guess if you grew up with that, it seemed normal to you. But to me, there was something so foreign about not seeing an altar and not seeing a tabernacle and not seeing pews and not the, the things that, 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 that we're sort of used to. So anything else in Zoomland? Anything else from in the church? I would just say, Father, you pointed out something beautiful about the Lord's Prayer. Absolutely. And the Lord's Prayer would be another example of this group composed piece of music. So if you're talking about having refrains, imagine that you said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And then you said a little bit more and stopped and went back and said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And picked up where you left off and said a little bit more. And then went back and said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If we did that to the Lord's Prayer, it might seem a bit strange. That's in effect what has happened to Gregoria. And so I'm sure somebody the, over the years has tried that with the Art Father. <laughs> oh, yeah. Good, good point, good point. Definitely, yeah, definitely good. No, it's good. That, that, that's a great point. So while I'm uh, closing up, I wanted to show these books one more time for the people at home. I'll leave these because I have pictures of them. So this is the book we're reading. So going back to Candacet. So the next time we meet, the first week is actually going to be Deacon John, because I'm going to be back in New Jersey with my family. So it's going to be Tuesday night. So if I didn't pass the test tonight or Lori and I didn't pass, you can go with Deacon John and Brother Elias. It's Tuesday, I think like the 19th or something like that. Then the next week on Monday, you'll get myself and Lori teaching the second part of this class. Um, so just it'll be in the bulletin, so just keep your eyes on that. But just so you know, there's a little bit of an inverse going on. Okay, so that's the book we're reading right now. We're going to do the next third of the book. It's in the bulletin. You'll figure it out. So the other book that I liked was this, The Catholic Church in the Bible. Give you a little bit of theology of the Bible, a little bit of theology of the Mass. Then it'll break down the prayers. And I'll leave this right here. You guys can snap pictures of it. Um, it'll give you line by line, verse by verse, where we get the prayers. I will confess right now, some of them are a little bit of a stretch. I was like, yeah, sometimes, you know, I was giving a tour of the church and we were showing all the stuff and one kid said, what about this? What does this mean? I'm like, well, sometimes a brick is just a brick, you know? So sometimes our prayers, <laughs> they're just a prayer. But he was trying his darndest to get a corresponding <laughs> scripture verse to it. And then this was the Latin mass explained. It goes a lot into the theology of the mass, um, the, the postures, the vestments, the altar stuff you're going to see. So I think it was Ben who asked, how do we get into it? Just keep, just keep learning, keep asking questions, right? Um, so with that, unless there's anything else, we'll say a closing prayer, and then we can go singing Gloria to the world. Anybody else? I'm going once. John, anything in Zoom land? Nope. All right. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Amen. So Lord, we join here in your beautiful church where we do offer this beautiful sacrifice. We ask that you would allow us to enter more deeply into, into the words we say, into the scriptures we say, that the music we sing, that when we come to worship, it is a truly active engagement of giving true glory and praise to God. We ask that you continue to touch our hearts. We ask that you continue to send souls to our, to our community here, that we can nurture them and they can nurture us. And we ask you to bless all that we do in your name, the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thanks, Zoomers.
Once again. 